In this lecture, we're going to review water, electrolyte, and acid-base balance. Much of the information in this chapter actually is um, sort of redundant. It, it's repeated from, much of it is repeated from prior chapters as far as um, electrolyte balance when we were talking in chemistry and MP1, but also certainly in the urinary system and the endocrine system. So you'll see those hormones again. And there's just a, a few little things that are new, but it, it is again a great chapter to read through because um, you have now a fairly good foundation in much of this. So it really just helps to augment and bring everything together. So I think um, these these types of chapters like this one that follows the urinary system and nutrition that will follow the digestive system, they really do a um, a very good job at sort of recapping that information. So let's go ahead and dive into this. It's usually a short, fairly short lecture since much of it isn't new, um, but we will go ahead and jump right in. So when we think about water in the body, it's an inorganic compound that is absolutely necessary for life. You know, the organic molecules like carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids get a lot of attention, but without water, life doesn't exist and water is um, we know that it makes up most of the body so when we think about uh, an average size person adult they have 40 liters of actual water in their system and that would be a normal amount where most of it is found is inside of cells this stands for intracellular uh, fluid so intracellular fluid about 65 percent and that's a good that's a good thing to know with that rough average now the other 35 percent is uh, is extracellular fluid that we call lymph we um or, you know csf synovial fluid pericardial fluid pleural fluid between the pleural linings of our lungs so all of that extra fluid that's about 35 percent of the rest of it. So when we think about how water moves, again, this is kind of intuitive, but we know that water moves between two areas of concentration by a process known as osmosis. So water will move from a higher concentration area to a lower until the hydrostatic pressure keeps it from moving any, any further. So when you drink, um, you know, water, and of course water is not really pure, but when you drink water, it's usually whatever you're drinking has a higher concentration of water than solutes. So it immediately within our GI tract will move into the bloodstream. And from the bloodstream, blood plasma is mostly water. It's going to move at the capillary level into our tissue spaces. We call that lymph, didn't we? The, the fluids that are bathing our cells that make up our tissues. Lymph will be moving into the lymphatic vessels, being filtered by lymph nodes, and eventually returned back to the bloodstream. So this is this is repeat of what we already know, but it's it's really a good visual. And I think that that's good for you to keep this in mind, that water is constantly moving through our system. So electrolytes are going to play a huge role in that. We know that water often follows sodium. We've heard that before, so we know that. And where we get water is mostly we're going to get it from food and drink, but we can also um, we can, there's also metabolic water that's actually created in the system, but we can lose water as well. So the gain and loss should be equal in any given day. So when you think about um, routes that we lose water, we're urinating, getting rid of our excess water, thank you kidneys, we're defecating, which also uh, is taking out some water. Every time we breathe out, CO2 and water are the what we're breathing out, isn't it? Sweat, and it's not always sweat that you can see, but we're sweat every day, so we're losing some of that through what's called uh, cutaneous transpiration. So um, we know that these are the ways we lose water and how we gain water, and again, it needs to be balanced. So uh, sometimes in medicine we're going to have a patient that you're going to have to me be measuring intake and output. Now you can't really measure all output because of course sometimes there's sweat you know that we understand and we're breathing out air you can't really measure that but you can measure the urine you can measure 
um, the fecal output. So you can measure that and you can measure intake as far as how much someone's taking in. And it really needs to be balanced. Dehydration we have defined as having um, too little of water in the system and that will decrease blood volume since we know plasma is mostly water and when blood volume decreases, blood pressure decreases. When you're dehydrated, it means that you're lacking water. It doesn't mean you're lacking solutes that are in the water, so the blood osmolarity increases. And again, repeat, you all understand that osmolarity is the percentage of solutes and solutes are anything but water um, that are in solution in the water. So there, when you are dehydrated, that one of the initial things that happens is that you get thirsty. Um, and with the thirst, you're typically going to seek out uh, liquids to drink. And as long as there's liquids available, it's rather rapidly corrected. We also know about these hormones again repeating this, right? Um, and we know about the hormones that play a role in this. So this is a lot of just repeat for you. We had stated in a previous chapter that the most common problem with hypovolemia, hypovolemia, too low of volume in the bloodstream, is that it can lead to dangerously low blood pressure. And that's called medical shock. Again, repeat for you, but when we have hypovolemia, we know the entire volume of the blood has dropped. So the osmolarity is actually normal, but this happens in bleeding out, hemorrhaging, which is bleeding out, burns, uh, chronic vomiting, and persistent vomiting and or diarrhea. It can lead to volume depletion. Dehydration, we just said, was a decrease in water, but osmolarity rises. So these are some of the um, causes of that. The most serious effects, so what happens when we have fluid deficiencies is shock, the potential for shock. The most, the first system that's going to be affected is the nervous system. So the nervous system will not be functioning, it will be depressed, and the nervous system controls all other homeostasis. Infants are most at risk for this because of their, it's, it's to do also with their uh, body size and their kidney functions, but they're the most at risk. The number one death of children under five actually, and especially infants, is dehydration. And that may be, I hope that'll be the saddest thing you hear today, because it is really sad because it is completely uh, reversible as long as the infant could get to some fluid intake. So even if it's through IV, but unfortunately, fluid deficiencies can happen quickly and the results can be devastating and then it gets to a point that you can't correct it. So infant mortality is often linked to fluid deficiencies. So again, these are just some pictures showing you about fluid loss and fluid balance. We can actually have um, too much fluid as well. So the most serious effects of too much fluid is going to be pulmonary edema and cerebral edema. So fluid that's compressing the lungs and fluid that is actually on um, the brain and the central nervous system. And with that extra fluid, those, those areas can't function. So these can be life-threatening if this actually happens. This slide is probably the most important um, slide and maybe even the entire textbook. We learned in the urinary system that a normal output of urine a day is going to be about one and a half to two liters a day. But what I want you to see, and we know what the definition for hypovolemia is, it means that your blood volume is decreasing such that the blood pressure is dropping and this can lead to cardiovascular shock and the heart can get a signal to just stop so going into cardiac arrest the reason i think this this graph is so um such an important one to look at is that over the hours of a day if you think about over the hours of a day if you're taking in fluid your kidneys can compensate for a huge amount of excess fluid you're just going to be urinating a lot so urinating and probably you know helps the bowels move as well so you're going to be losing any extra your blood volume is going to be maintained thank you kidneys you do an amazing job at that but what I want you to see is how quickly you can get into serious trouble 
So just the difference between one and a half liter intake down to less than one, you can get in trouble quickly. And so this is um, this is what how we understand how we understand that people end up even after well it would depend on the environment if it's a really hot arid environment it would happen more quickly but how people can't go more than a couple of days a few days without water without that then they are not going to make it because they're in hypovolemic shock and the heart's going to get a signal to just stop so you can go a long time without food but you cannot really go very long at all without water intake so we had defined edema and again it's a, you know it's going through a few things we also have already defined hematomas we know that this is bruising um, and with what bruising really is it's bleeding into the tissue spaces so still when you think about bruises we tend to think of them as not being so such of such great concern unless there are a lot of them and if there are a lot of them that means that that blood has been lost to the circulation and it certainly can affect blood volume pleural effusions these are when sometimes uh, fluid is being sequestered in the pleural um, region and so this can accumulate can happen because of lung infections it's what we tend to think about but also in heart disease so congestive heart failure can also cause that to happen and um, it can require removing several liters of fluid um, you know it, sometimes each day it's it really can accumulate quickly it's kind of shocking how water moves between the systems we know there's a difference in osmolarity between these different compartments so keeping electrolytes balanced is vital because that's going to play a role in how this water moves and when we think about electrolytes we we learned in chemistry that these are also called ions that can be positively charged or negatively charged but they are charged atoms which means that they are providing the electricity for your body they're also um, providing the potential for action potentials in our cells and resting maintaining resting potential potentials so when we think about the common ones that are positively charged that's sodium potassium calcium and hydrogen the ones that are negatively charged, chloride, phos uh, phosphate, and bicarbonate. So these are just some of the more common ones, and we know that they need to be maintained. When electrolyte balance gets off, again, this can be a, uh, depending on which electrolyte, this can be certainly an emergency situation, and there needs to be a correction of that. The sodium potassium pumps in all of our cells are working 24 7 it requires ATP this is just one of the many reasons that cells need ATP charged batteries that molecule adenosine triphosphate that is our charged battery molecule that allows for work to be done in the cells so we understand that um, these are functioning all the time deficiencies of sodium are really rare sodium is abbreviated na because the latin word for sodium was natrium so na aldosterone here here are these hormones again aldosterone from the adrenal glands is going to help you to retain sodium retain sodium but you're going to lose potassium at the same time so remember pos, pos, light charged um, substances repel each other right so sodium is being pulled in but potassium is remaining in the filtrate and if it remains in that filtrate long enough through those tubules and the nephrons and the collecting ducts it means it's staying in the the liquid and it stays in to now it's going to be called urine and it's going to be lost okay so aldosterone this is a reminder plays a huge role in that we know that ANF or AMP um, factor peptide I'm not the only one that change, interchanges those it seems like your textbook does too um, this is going to do the opposite of aldosterone so you are going to actually excrete lose sodium to the filtrate which eventually is in the urine and water follows that so that decreases blood pressure and then others that play a role too so just looking at these hormones and how sodium is in, is affected hypernatremia means too much right so I don't really ask you to know the normal ranges of this 
but um, you know of, of these now but when you get into clinicals you will be looking at these normal ranges so it wouldn't be a bad idea to look at them now but obviously if you've got too much sodium then you have water retention water retention is increasing blood volume which could lead to hypertension which is high blood pressure and edema so some people have more of a predisposition for conserving sodium darker skinned people have more of a predisposition for conserving sodium because it was an, ele an evolutionary adaptive gene darker toned people originated closer to the equator of the earth where it's hotter and when it's hotter you sweat more so to prevent you from sweating too much you at uh, this this gene evolved that darker toned people really can conserve sodium really very well so they have to be particularly careful not to have too much sodium in their diets because they're good at conserving it and if they're conserving too much then they're going to have uh, problems with hypertension and potentially edema. This is why we see, um, you know, black people, dark, uh, darker tone people, having a higher incidence of high blood pressure and more serious outcomes from that high blood pressure. So knowing this, so important to talk to and educate people from a very young age that we have too much sodium in our foods don't we uh, and we really don't need that much sodium that we take in hyponatremia um, is going to be not enough enough sodium and so um, typically that is a rare kind of finding that we see and so we don't really see it that often but that can that could actually happen too um, Potassium, this is the most abundant intracellular, the, the cation that's the most abundant inside of our cells, where sodium was the most abundant outside of our cells. Again, we learned that in AMP1, it is the predominant extracellular cation, potassium being the predominant intracellular cation. And it's very, very important to, to know that this is probably the most dangerous electrolyte imbalance. So we want to realize that this is the most dangerous electrolyte imbalance um, that we encounter. And the reason being hyperkalemia, this means high potassium in the bloodstream. This can, if it happens quickly, like because our cells are crushed and, and there's a lot of this inside of our cells, so the cells get crushed and potassium is now in the in the blood plasma. This is actually going to um, cause the nerves and muscles to be abnormally excitable, and it can lead to arrhythmias. If the onset of hyperkalemia is slow, so hyperkalemia, the effects are going to depend on how fast this happens or how slow this happens. If it's slow, it's actually going to make those the muscle cells less excitable and again can lead to arrhythmias and or suffocation so these are this is pretty serious hyperkalemia right hypokalemia which we tend to see um, most often this can be because of a lot of different reasons but again this is going to cause them to depress the nerve and the muscle function and when that depresses the nerve and muscle function it decreases our reflexes which we know help us to survive but but even more emergency um, type of situation is that it's going to lead to arrhythmias. So the heart rhythm is going to change and the heart can get a signal to just stop. So potassium imbalances are the most dangerous imbalances that we see. Chloride, chloride um, plays a role in balancing pH and we tend to think about chloride balance along with the sodium balance and the really the effects of this are pretty slow and usually the body can handle um, these uh, these imbalances so typically typically these these imbalances are things that can be rather easily corrected calcium we have learned in our skeletal system study that calcium is also one of those um, electrolytes that you need to be remaining in homeostasis 
Too much can be deadly, too little can be deadly. The reason is for nerve communication, blood clotting, muscle and muscle contractions. These are certainly skeletal system mineralizations important too, but these are the ones that make this so deadly that, you know, because if this gets out of balance today, your bones aren't going to really change too much today. But you can actually have tetany, which is a sustained muscle contraction that can cause you to suffocate. So that's just one example. Or you could bleed out. It, you know, if there's an imbalance in calcium. So we need calcium homeostasis to happen. We have parathyroid hormone, again, revisiting these hormones. Calcitriol from the kidneys, calcitonin from the thyroid gland. Please revisit these. We understand how important calcium homeostasis um, is. And again, this is repeat, not a bad thing to be repeating making sure that we understand this and all the things that can go along with this. So please do, do read through this and be um, reminded of how important calcium imbalances can be. So phosphates, again, act as buffers. This is our, their main fu function. And when we think about phosphates, the imbalances, just sort of like chloride, are not quite as critical, not as critical as that potassium and that calcium imbalances, right? So we understand that um, they're necessary to be balanced, but not as critical. And the body is pretty able, pretty much able to compensate when needed to get those back in balance. Acid-base balance, so important. You know, we've talked about pH. I know this is all repeat for you, but we've talked about what pH is, which is essentially understanding how many hydrogen ions are present in whatever you may be measuring, whether it is blood, whether it is extracellular fluid, whether it is cerebrospinal fluid, wherever it may be that you are maintaining your range for pH. Um, we know that acids are going to have um, a lower number on the scale, but it means that they have more hydrogen ions present. That scale is written inversely proportional to how much hydrogen ion is present. If you go back and remember from AMP1, pH is defined as the negative logarithm of the concentration of the hydrogen ion. And that negative meant that hydrogen ion is inversely proportional to the number on the scale. So lower than 7, 7.35 in blood or body fluids, most most body fluids, um, is considered acidic. And when it is, the number is going higher, it means that there, there are less hydrogen ions. So we have all kinds of buffering systems that keep it. pH is so important to be balanced that we have two major organ systems that are balancing hydrogen ion concentrations. We have the respiratory system, which we said pH is the major stimulus, and we have the urinary system. The respiratory system happens, can help to correct rapidly. The urinary system takes a little bit longer, but both organ systems are buffering systems. We also have many chemical buffering systems as well. So um, bicarbonate, phosphate, all types of chemical buffering systems. The definition of a buffer, if in case someone doesn't know that, is anything that can help to resist a change in pH. So that would be the definition for a buffering system. You all will remember this equation from our respiratory um, chapter where we have we know the end products of aerobic respiration are carbon dioxide and water but as they build up in our system because our cells are pumping those out as end products of aerobic respiration bicarbonate uh, carbonic acid forms but quickly will be converted to bicarbonate and hydrogen ions this is going to be lowering your pH making you more acidic but as you become more acidic, your respiration rates increase. This will be reversed and you will blow this off, right? So we understand that. And the kidneys play a huge role as well, not just the respiratory, but also the kidneys. Um, and then it, you can see this, this phosphate buffering system as well. So there's lots of slides associated with this, but the main idea is that 
you can't withstand too much of a variation. This slide makes me a little crazier than I normally am um, because it's talking about 6.8 being associated with death. Um, death happens way before then. So I can promise you it's way before then. This is a much, t in, in reality, this is really a much tighter scale than this. This, is, this slide is a great visual because it shows you that when there are a lot of extracellular hydrogen ions, which means you're becoming acidic, acidic, the number is lowering on the scale, there, the concentration is going to be so great that just simple diffusion doesn't take any energy. These are going to move inside your cells. They have positive charges, so the potassium that's supposed to be in your cell functioning <laughs> it's the predominant intracellular cation potassium. These like charges are going to repel potassium. So your potassium, your extracellular potassium is going to start to go up. You're becoming hyperkalemic. And as you're becoming hyperkalemic, the onset's sometimes pretty slow, but still it's going to have a detrimental effect on the central nervous system. And it's also going to have an effect on muscles. So this is, um, so this is obvious, obviously, as you can see, we said potassium is a, the most dangerous electrolyte in balance. So this is the problem when someone's in acidosis. When they're in acidosis, it's going to interfere with the potassium balance. When someone is in alkalosis, then we're going to have kind of the um, hypokalemia happening. And we said that's dangerous too, because that can lead to, that can lead to all kinds of things with muscles um, causing arrhythmias of the heart, respiratory paralysis leading to tetany. So that's not good either. It needs to be balanced, right? So there are different causes of the acid base imbalances, respiratory acidosis, we have respiratory alkalosis due to hyperventilation. And then there are also metabolic disorders like diabetes, alcoholism, um, the, the overuse of drugs, sometimes over the counter, sometimes prescribed, sometimes illicit. But these can actually cause this as well. Um, metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. Either way, none of these are good and they need to be balanced. Again, so important that your body has two whole organ systems trying to maintain it and also other chemical buffering systems as well. So this is talking about those systems that are trying to maintain this. So this is the end of our water electrolyte um, and acid base balance chapter. I think you saw that this was a lot of repeat from, from information we had from back from AMP1 and talking about pH and how important pH balance is, but also respiratory, endocrine, and urinary. So a great chapter to just read through as, in your leisure because it can really pull some of that information together. So I hope that um, I hope that you enjoyed that, and our next set of information will be on the digestive system and nutrition. See you then.